Now then, with a view to the blessing of God, let's uh, turn to Second Peter again and uh, chapter 3. And reading again in verse 4, where we read of the scoffers who ask this question, Where is the promise of his coming? And the reason for that question, For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. Of creation. So where is the promise of his coming? Or really as the question means. Where is the coming itself? Or where is the promised coming? Of course they know where the promise is. They, they know the promise is in the Bible. But where's the event? And the fact that the event hasn't appeared. Seems to them to be. An argument for believing that it actually never will take place at all. Now the theme of the last chapter here is the second coming of Christ and of course the, the end of all things which that event ushers in. So the second coming itself. Now the Bible of course clearly teaches that our Lord will return. The Bible taught that he would come the first time and he came, it also teaches that he will come a second time and he will come. And the whole church everywhere and in all ages has believed that. And we await the return of our Lord. Just as he left bodily and visibly, raised up into heaven, so he will descend from heaven bodily and visibly. Although, as the scriptures tell us, when he returns... This time it will not be uh, in order to be a sin bearer in his humiliation, but it will be in his glory with all the holy angels with him. Now, although the whole church has believed that and taught that and waited uh, for the coming of the Lord, um, it's important to notice that some in the early church expected that return of the Lord very, very soon. You'll find it in the Apostles' own writing. For example, Paul has to write to the church in Thessalonica in the letter to the Thessalonians, where he tells them to get on with their lives in a way in which they were obviously not doing. And the reason they weren't planning for the future or taking the future much into consider consideration was because they thought that the Lord would return uh, any time, that he would return imminently. Now, Paul corrects that. Far from that being the actual case, uh, Paul corrects it. And at various places in the New Testament, we're told of certain things that have to happen before the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And it's important to remember these things. He tells the Thessalonians, for example, that the Lord will not return until the Antichrist has arisen and fallen. He also uh, tells us that the gospel will spread throughout the nations in a way that will bring them all to acknowledge Christ officially as Lord and Saviour. And he also tells us that a time will come when the Jewish people will be engrafted again back into the olive tree and become part of his own people. So these things have to happen before the Lord returns. And in fact, Christ himself he told the church that it would be a long time before he returned. And if you read some of the parables very carefully, you'll notice that an important truth in these parables is that there is a perceived delay in the coming of the Lord. Now, I'll come to this idea of a delay in a minute, but there's at least a perceived delay in the coming of the Lord, so much so uh, that many people uh, will lose hope in it. You have, of course, the wise and the foolish virgins, or the parable of the talents, or the, the man who began to beat his fellow servants in the house because he saw that the master was delaying his coming. So all these parables are designed to tell us that it will be a long time, an unexpectedly long time before the Lord returns. And as I said, the sense of hope and the sense of expectation of that return 
is likely to diminish. And especially when iniquity abounds, the love of many will become cold, because many of the Lord's people themselves are failing to look upward and to remember the return of the Lord. And Peter, of course, is writing this second letter when he's nearing his own death. And he's telling them uh, in the letter that he's about to put off his tabernacle. He speaks of his body as a temporary tent. Of course, he's looking forward, like Paul, to having a new body in glory, but he's about to put off the tabernacle. He says, as the Lord showed me, Christ had told Peter how he would die for himself. And before he dies, he reminds the people of many things, but especially to have a right attitude to Christ's return. And first of all, they're to believe in that return with faith. And by that I mean that they believe it on the authority of the word of God. So they're to believe in the fact of Christ's return by faith. Then second, they're to look forward to it with hope and expectation. And third, they're to live in the light of that return uh, with godly conduct and with diligence. So they're to believe it by faith, they're to look forward to it with expectation, and they're to live in the light of it with diligence. I suppose if you just make that love, you have faith, hope, and love. Now this morning I just want to confine ourselves to the importance of believing it and believing it with faith. In other words, as I said, on the authority of the word of God, the God who cannot lie. Now it's important, of course, to believe it because not everyone does. And as the last days advance, those who disbelieve it will become more and more vocal. And these people are marked out in two ways. And you see these two ways clearly in verse 3 of the chapter. That's 2 Peter 3 and verse 3. We're to know this first. No, that's not first of all. It just means as a priority. We were to take note of this, that scoffers will come in the last days and they will be marked out first of all by their lifestyle they will be walking according to their own lusts so far from following god and showing that in their life the opposite is the case their lives will reveal that they are not really believers in god in verse 11 you'll notice that those who believe in the second coming are distinguished in their lifestyle by holiness. Verse 11, since all these things will be dissolved, that's the world and the cosmos itself, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? But these people, these scoffers, have a different lifestyle. They are walking according to their own lusts. Now, I read this passage recently to you, but Paul says the same thing to Timothy. In these last days, he says, perilous times will come. And these times of peril are always always recognized by human behavior reaching ungodly limits. Men will be lovers of themselves. Now, I think I said before, when I read this before, that In many respects, all these characteristics are true of us anyway, as unbelievers. But in the last days, and in times of particular peril, when restraint is cast off, all these things become really prominent. They they mark out a generation. So men are lovers of themselves. Narcissistic. Vain. They will be lovers of money. Covetousness will be obvious, evident. Boasters, self-projection of image and power, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, 
unloving, unforgiving. I'll crucify you for a word. Slanderers, lacking self-control, despisers of what is good, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And if they have any semblance of godliness, they've only got a form of it which denies its real power. Now, I don't think I need to argue the case to you that we are living in such perilous times. You will have recognised a description of the West as we know it, and certainly the countries that we live in, by the terms I've just read from the Apostle. So these men in the last days are marked out by their lifestyle, but also by their attitude to the Gospel, particularly because Peter calls them scoffers. In verse 3 of our text, scoffers will come in the last days. The word means in the Greek, well, just what it means in the English there, to ridicule something or to make a, a mockery of something. And the thing that they're mocking particularly is the idea here that the this figure or this man who was uh, crucified on the authority of Rome is somehow uh, going to return from heaven and make his presence known in the whole world. Of course, that's an absurdity because to them he's not alive anyway. He's not at the right hand of God. He doesn't rule there, so he's not going to come in power and in glory. They find the whole thing ridiculous. Where is this promised coming? And they speak of it with contempt and with arrogance. And Peter's really referring to that in verse 9, in the well-known text where he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, or the Lord is not slow or tardy or negligent concerning his promise, as some count slackness or tardiness or slowness or negligent concerning his promise. So they've got a kind of arrogance and a contempt for it. And quite clearly the, the spirit of mockery is there and we know that spirit very well. It says effectively, oh well, this saviour that you're waiting for, have you not been waiting a long time for this saviour? I mean, here we are 2,000 years after these events, 2,000. And if these poor people in Thessalonica thought that, oh, well, he was going to come any time, and everybody since has been saying, well, he may well come any time, are you not starting to look a bit stupid 2,000 years later, believing that this character is going to return from heaven in power and in glory to judge the whole world, the world that judged himself and crucified him? Do you really believe he's going to return that he's alive and going to return and to judge the earth. Now Peter, of course, is addressing this apparent delay and the reasons for it. Now, by saying apparent delay, I mean, I'm using that carefully because there is no delay, of course. The only way you can know something is delayed is by knowing the appointed time. And you've also got to be able to measure that time properly. And only when you measure time properly and when you have a set appointed time, only then can you actually know if something is delayed or not. Now, the fact is that Christ gave no time in connection with his return. And that's just the facts. There are many people who try to uh, work out the time of his return on the basis of certain biblical calculations in the book of Revelation and notably in the book of Daniel. Now there may be events certainly that you can prophesy from there but not the time of Christ's return. Not only did he say that it would be a long time, he explicitly said of that day and of that hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven but my father only. Now he, he said those words in connection with a a threefold question that the disciples had asked. They had asked when the temple would be destroyed and what would the sign be of his coming and of the end of his age, of the age. Now, when I say threefold question, I think they thought that was one question. 
I think they thought everything was going to happen together. Temple destroyed, the coming of the Lord, and the end of the age. But the Lord separates these out. They're not going to happen at the same time. The destruction of the temple uh, will happen in their own generation, in their own lifetime. Jerusalem itself will be destroyed in their own lifetime. And he gives the details and the signs of that happening. But then he says, but of that day, that is of my coming, and that hour, he says, no one knows. No signs of that. The angels don't know, only my Father in heaven. So from that we understand that the Lord himself was not given to know that in his state of humiliation. We of course believe that he does know it in his state of exaltation. But Paul reminds them, sorry, Peter reminds them too that the measurement of time is different for everyone as well, at least in how we perceive it. And time has a lot to do with perception. You know yourself that if you're enjoying yourself for half an hour, you say, where did that go? If you're not enjoying yourself for five minutes, it feels like an eternity. Um, of course, the perception of time in heaven will be completely different from the perception of time in hell. Completely different. That's not to, to say that there is no time in heaven and hell. There is time in both. But the perception of both will be completely different. But as far as God's concerned, he's outside of time anyway. He, he doesn't experience time like we do at all. He's outside of it. And for him, Peter says, a thousand years is like one day, and one day is like a thousand years. In other words, it just doesn't mean anything. Um, some people try and make a kind of formula out of that, and they, they try and apply it to the days of creation. It could be a thousand years because a day is like a thousand years, but it works both ways round. A day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day, which is a way of saying it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything to God. What you think of as a long time is just twinkling of an eye for him. He's outside of it. He doesn't measure it the same way. In other words, he's got his timetable of events. He's got his timetable, and there's no delay of any kind. We're taught in the New Testament that God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that man, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all we need to know. It's not the when, it's the fact of. He has appointed a day. And obviously that day was 2,000 years at least in the future from when these things were written. That's all we need to know. It's appointed, so there's no delay. But you'll notice that those who are ridiculing the idea of Christ returning to, to judge the world, to bring things to a close. You'll notice that those who are ridiculing that have got another reason for doing so. It's not just because time passes, it's taken such a long time, but because there's such uniformity in the world. There's such evidence of uniformity on the earth and in the cosmos. Everything's the same. And as far as they're concerned, everything always has been the same from the beginning of creation. And although they use the word creation, it doesn't necessarily mean they believe it. It's just a, a way of speaking about the beginning. That's why you find cosmologists, for example, who do not accept the biblical teaching on creation, they'll still use the word creation just as a kind of expression for what's there. They may say, for example... Well, the creation began with a big bang. So they use the word creation, but they don't mean it in the same way. God's not in it. God's not behind it. God's not involved. But their whole idea is one of uniformity. Now, uniformity can certainly lull you into a false sense of security. That's the way we're made, you know. If things just happen day by day, we presume that they're going to happen day by day. And we presume they've always been that way. And, and we all know that. Here they're really saying, deep down, that the laws of physics and chemistry and biology have always been at work in space and on the earth. And practically in a day-to-day -day way, that means that the sun rises and it sets every single day. 
The sun's always there. Nothing's going to change that. The tide ebbs and flows. The seasons come and go. Summer, autumn, winter, and then spring again. An obvious regularity. And they're saying, in effect, can you, can you not tell that we're in a closed system? That just um, is, is, is um, working according to the regulations of these laws. It's just always been that way. And there's no intervention coming. No intervention. Of course, that's not a complete picture. Um, we would grant, of course, as Christians, and we grant it on the authority of the Bible, that there is a regularity. And a regularity that God has placed there. He's put a regularity in the cosmos. He's put a regularity upon the earth. He's appointed that regularity. The sun and the moon and the stars. By his decree, he placed them where they are. He put that boundary upon the sea so that it would come in so far and come in no further. There, there is a fine tuning in the universe that is, people will admit, a marvel, even if they don't accept it as creation, but there is a fine tuning that makes it all just stay in place. And it stay in place, stays in place because God has fixed it there. The Lord has established it of old, and therefore it remains. But these people are forgetting, and this is what Peter says, they're forgetting that God has intervened in the past. He said he would intervene, and he did intervene. And when he says he's going to intervene in the future, he is going to intervene. And he gives three examples of intervention. And they're all very important. They're all very important because they all come in connection with the Word of God. Now, the Word of God is important in the whole passage because faith is our response to the Word of God. We need to remember that all the time. Faith is our response to the Word of God. And in the past, God said he would do certain things, and he did them. And on two of these occasions, it was doubted by people, but nonetheless, it happened. Now, the first is not strictly an intervention because it's the actual creation of the world itself. And rather than being an intervention, that's really an initiation of things. It's the beginning of things. But the Bible tells us that the world didn't come about through natural processes and neither did God use pre-existing things in order to shape the cosmos as we know it. In Hebrews 11.3, we read that by faith we understand. Now notice that juxtaposition there of reason and faith. He doesn't say by faith we believe simply, but by faith we understand this, that the worlds were framed, an interesting word, everything put into its place, by the word of God, so we understand that, so, he says, that the things which are seen, all the visible things, were not made of things which are visible. Visible things were not made out of visible things. Now, that's what the materialist will say. The, the people who don't believe in God say that visible things were made out of visible things. They believe in the eternity of matter. I, I reference that in the tract uh, that I wrote there. They believe that the whole universe was originally uh, a pinhead of dense matter, incredibly dense matter, that exploded to create the universe as we know it, which is still expanding until it reaches a point where it begins to fall back in itself and according to their own teaching, will eventually become a pinhead again, a dense pinhead, and will again explode, and will again come together, and again explode, and again come together. Now, for that to be so, the pinhead always had to be there. There had to be a pinhead to start, of incredibly dense matter. So that they say the visible things were made out of things that are visible. And as I alluded to in the tract, you can believe that if you like. But 
to my mind, it requires a lot of faith to believe that. It requires far more faith than I've got to believe that everything just happened like that. I, I find it, with all due respect, far easier to believe what the Lord has told me in connection with creation than what people tell me in connection with creation. I find that position quite absurd, and I find that it doesn't answer any of our greatest questions, including why we ask questions at all in the first place. The ability to ask extraordinary questions is quite amazing if we all just came from a dense pinhead of matter. It really is. But in any case, by faith, we understand that things seen were not made of visible things. You'll notice the word of God is attacking materialism here uh, 2,000 years ago. This whole idea that, that, that has gripped people's minds is not new. People think that this is a modern way of thinking. There's nothing modern about it. It's an extremely old point of view that there is no God and that everything just came from matter. It's a very old point of view, and it's being addressed here by the word of God. You know, you know there's this idea that w we are the enlightened generation, that, th that this generation in the 21st century is, is the generation that really knows and really understands. It's asking the hard questions that people ever asked before. What a load of nonsense that is. We're no wiser, no smarter, no cleverer than the people who came before us. That's, that's just the fact of the matter. And the Bible addresses these things. And Peter tells us here that the earth was formed by God originally out of the water and by means of water. That it was that swirling chaos above the molten mass of the earth that pushed the earth underneath into shape and eventually at God's command it's described poetically and graphically in Psalm 104 at his rebuke the earth receded into its subterranean channels where it largely exists today and the earth appears with the bounds that God commanded um, water on the earth is an amazing thing People say, you know, that water covers 71% of the Earth's surface. Well, that's true. As far as I know, that's true. But what's also true is that in the subterranean channels, underneath the crust, you have three times as much water as there is in the oceans, which is an astonishing amount of water. And it helps you see why at the beginning the waters covered the Earth until the Lord brought them back in and the dry land appeared. Now that was done by the word of God. Solely by the word of God. No other agency but that. That is the energy uh, that brought the cosmos into being. Now the energy that's uh, placed into the cosmos is an astonishing thing. Uh, the Greeks thought that the atoms um, were the smallest things that constituted the fabric of the universe. And lo and behold, you split an atom and you discover the power. The power. Uh, the power inside there. And, and think of the energy that is in the cosmos. You can't. I mean, you cannot conceive of it. That energy is a product of God himself. He simply spoke it into being. And it was done. What a powerful God uh, we have. The second instance of divine intervention is, strictly speaking, an intervention rather than an initiation. Because, amazingly, the world that God created, uh, and I use this word um, in an advised way, is a world that he then proceeded to decreate. By that I mean that he put it all back under water again. What happened with the flood is, a, is an astonishing thing. People think it just rained for 40 days and 40 nights and there was a flood. There's a lot more to the flood than that. Uh, the water in the flood came from the subterranean channels. Yes, it, it did come down from heaven for 40 days and 40 <coughs> nights, but that's only a fraction of the water. The vast bulk of the water came when Genesis tells us that the fountains of the great deep were broken up. And the crust of the earth rips and starts to pull apart. And everything that's underneath just comes out. And the whole world is deluged. 
to the point where the earth becomes a swirling mass covered in water again and God reshapes and recreates. That's a stunning event. That's God saying, I'm finished with that. And here it is starting again. The reasons for that, of course, were to do with sin, with the evil that abounded. And when evil burst its banks like that, God, we're told in a very vivid anthropomorphic remark, um, regretted that he had made man on the face of the earth because the imagination of man's heart was the reasoning. That's what the word means as it's used in the AV. The reasoning of man's heart was corrupt, exceedingly so, to the point where only one family, one family, maintained the witness of God upon the earth. On the very day when the Lord ripped open the fountains of the deep, and the rain began to fall from heaven. Now God had said that he would do so, and of course the people did not believe it. He said that he would do so. He communicated that to Noah. Noah, of course, communicated it to the world. And as he was building the ark, there was an invitation with it to come into the ark, but no one did. There's a, there's a rebuke to human pride and intelligence in the fact that the animal kingdom came inside the ark for salvation, but mankind did not. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm well aware, we all know that it was God who took the, these primitive animal uh, representatives into the ark. He took them in there and he preserved them. But there is nonetheless a kind of preaching and a rebuke in the fact that the animals came in to the ark, but nobody who heard the message from Noah, who's called here a preacher of righteousness, we don't find him in Genesis 6 uh, really preaching as such, but Peter tells us that he was that. He was a preacher of God's righteousness, how to be righteous before God. And I've no doubt that he used the ark that he was building as an illustration of how God would save and protect, but they didn't listen. They didn't believe because they believed that the world was established with a fixed and regular series of cycles that nothing was ever going to break. The more things change, the more they remain the same. And the earth again became covered in water. It's not long since... Um, the whole world of geologists used to recognize a global flood, but very few do now. But I'll come to back, back to that in a second. The third example of God's intervention is not in the immediate context here in chapter 3, but we read it in chapter 2, and it's to do with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's very often coupled with the flood in the Bible. In fact, the little passage that we read from the Gospels, where Christ was speaking, he couples the flood with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Just as the flood tells us something about what God is going to do in the future, so does the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah tell us something about what God is going to do in the future, not by water, but with fire. God spoke of its destruction. And that message was given to Lot from the angels, Lot became a preacher of righteousness to his generation and we're told that when he told them that the cities were going to be destroyed, we're told that they mocked him. That's the word used, they mocked him. Even his sons-in-law, they mocked him when he told them earnestly that these cities in which they lived were going to be destroyed. Now, you know why these cities were destroyed, uh, because they had an abundance of bread, they lived idle lives, and they had plunged into sexual decadence. And they had created a, a mini community, these five cities of the plain, which were marked out by stark disobedience to God. And God said, enough. And when Lot said that God was going to intervene, the people didn't accept it. They thought he was mad. The word of God created, the word of God decreated, and the word of God judged. He said it would, and it happened. But Peter says that these people are forgetting these events. Look again at verses 4 and 5. 
These people are saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Then he says, for this they willfully forget. A, the creation that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water. B, by which water and word of God the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. They forget these things. But you'll notice it doesn't say simply that they forget these things, but that they willfully forget these things. Now, I'm sure you know the difference between forgetting something and willfully forgetting something. Forgetting something is sadly what happens to some of us an awful lot. Willfully forgetting something is when you don't want to know and you don't want to remember and you simply blot it out and you repress it. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. And in fact, that's pretty much akin to holding it in contempt. Because if there's something you don't want to know, and it's bad news, sometimes by laughing at it, you can put it away from yourself. And uh, people find it easier to cope with the idea of God and judgment if they just mock the thing and laugh at it. See, once you mock a thing and laugh at it, you bring it under your control. That's what you're trying to do anyway. You're bringing it under your control. You are the authority over it. That's how they respond to these things. Now, Paul calls it suppressing the truth. In other words, you know it. It's written for you, but you don't want to believe it. And that's the key. You don't want to believe it. So you dismiss it out of your mind. You deny the creation, you deny a creator, you deny the flood. I I think, I'm sure I referenced this in the tract as well. It's a remarkable thing. This obsession with finding life in the universe and finding traces of water, finding amino acids and all these things, there's a, I'm sure you're aware there's there's an obsession with that. And There's a religious motivation behind that, or if you like, an irreligious motivation behind that. It's not a scientific quest. Um, People think that scientists are the great neutrals in the world, as though they have no axe to grind. Oh, believe me, they have axes to grind. Everybody has axes to grind. And uh, I'm sure I told you before of a program I heard years ago, this is going back years now, but um, where uh, where a prominent scientist was talking about some of these things. And he was asked on the radio, is there room for a creator in this? And his answer was, we've got the creator hanging on in there by his fingertips. Now, you make of that what you will, but I'll tell you what it said to me very clearly, was that that man was no neutral. That man absolutely had a motivation. And given a choice between what he was going to believe, I have no doubt in my mind what he was going to believe. Do you? That's why people who are desperate to find water on Mars actually believe that Mars was covered in water, the whole planet. Because from a distance they see evidences that it may be water-shaped although no water has been seen or observed in it. You look at planet Earth uh, from the point of view where you're looking down on the Pacific Ocean, and you'll find just a couple of bits of land. The rest is just a big ball of blue. Because, as I said, 71% of it is covered in water, and three times that is underneath in subterranean channels. And everything on the face of the Earth shows signs of water sedimentation and being shaped by water. And you ask, do you think the earth may have been shaped by water? No. We don't believe it was flooded. But you believe Mars was? Oh, yes. Now, is that what you want to believe? Or what you believe? This is where the will's coming in, you see. This they willfully forget. They willfully forget that there was a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. 
They willfully forget that God spoke about bringing everything into being by the word of his power. They don't want to know. And it's obvious why. We all know why. We all know. You know why in your own heart. You find it convenient to believe something that allows you to live the way you want to live. You breathe a sigh of relief when anything comes to the fore that you may think discredits the word of God because it gives you license to walk according to the lusts of your own heart. You see, there is a connection here between the way that they scoff the word of God on the one hand and live according to the lusts of their own hearts on the other. These things are not accidentally both there at the same time. They, they, they come together. We believe what we want to believe to further the kind of life that we want to live. The consequences of believing that the earth was flooded are simply too great. Why? Because it gives credence to Genesis chapter 6. Even if there are fossils found on the highest mountains of the earth, of sea creatures, no, it was never flooded. It was never flooded. Because if it's flooded, the Bible might be true. If the Bible's true, I'm in trouble. Nobody wants to believe that. And in terms of this kind of continuity, you see, I spoke earlier about continuity lulling us into a false sense of security. Because you think today is like yesterday, so tomorrow is going to be like today. Christ said, that's the very thing you've got to be aware of in connection with my return, he says. Don't be comfortable about the idea of my return. Always be alive to it, always be alert to it. Always be awake and not asleep. In Noah's day, he said, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage until the day that the fountains of the great deep were opened up. Day by day, just eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage. Of course, people who get married like that and are given in marriage are, are planning for a future. So they were living day-to-day -day lives ordinarily and they were making ordinary plans for the future until the day. The day, not the week or the year. It's not as though there were events that were just uh, telling you that the thing was going to happen. Until the very day life went on as normal. And the same was true in Sodom. Jesus tells us himself that on the day Sodom was destroyed, they were still eating and drinking. They were buying and selling. They were planting and building. Again, living day to day and planning for the future. Until the, the day that Lot went out of Sodom. And then it rained fire and sulfur from heaven. In fact, there's an interesting uh, touch in the Bible in Genesis 19 when it describes the destruction of Sodom. It tells us that the sun had risen on the earth on the day that Lot went out and arrived in Zoar, the city that God would spare. The sun had risen. It's almost a way of saying, oh, well, it's just another day in Sodom. But it wasn't just another day in Sodom. And one day in your own life, it's not going to be just another day. And in the history of the world, it's not going to be just another day. It will begin with the rising of the sun, but it won't end with the setting of the sun. I suppose the sun rising is the ultimate in continuity and predictability. But it's the day that God said enough for Sodom and Gomorrah. Now if God's promised to intervene, and if he's done so in the past, just very briefly, why does he take so long? Well, it's nothing to do with delay, but it's everything to do with grace. We're told here, in verse 9, that the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some consider him to be slow, but he is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is long-suffering. Long-suffering means taking long to be angry. Macrothumia. Macrothumia means sh short temper. Short-tempered is somebody who, who responds really quickly with anger. Long-tempered 
has the same word in it, thumia, anger, but it takes long to be angry. We're told here that God is long-tempered, not short-tempered. He, he lets things go, not in the sense of not reckoning them, taking account for them or judging them, but he leaves them be until he deals with it in his wrath. The Bible tells us that he's slow to wrath. Slow to wrath. Unto wrath and anger slow. The fact is that the world, as, as we see it just now, is being preserved and reserved. On the one hand, it's being preserved. Marvelously. There are plenty of forces underneath the crust that would destroy this earth in the twinkling of an eye. Many forces in the universe that could obliterate this earth in the twinkling of an eye. But God preserves it. The one who created it uh, so that it's placed by his fixed decree is sustaining it. The Lord Jesus Christ, we're told, is upholding it by the very word of his power. Isn't that astonishing? The Lord Jesus Christ is upholding all things by the word of his power. It's preserved. It's also reserved, which is slightly different. Reserved means that it's actually coming towards its appointed end. And that is judgment by the Lord Jesus Christ. He will judge it. And in this period of preservation and reservation, well, what marks out this period is the grace of God, symbolized by the rainbow. It's always struck me as astonishing that, pe that the people who most want to defy God's norms for living are the people who take a rainbow and use it to promote their own cause. Whereas the actual rainbow is giving the reason why God's not dealing with that. The actual rainbow is saying, I'm seeing you. I know that you are provoking me. But as long as I say so, I am preserving this world. And I'm giving a message of multicolored grace. Because I am not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. If you go back to 1 Peter here, and in chapter 3, just for a second. And in verse um, 18. Uh, we're told how Christ went... Um, how Christ, Christ preached by his Holy Spirit before the flood. Christ also suffered once for sins. That's 1 Peter 3, 18, page 1858. He suffered the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh but made alive by the Spirit. By whom? That's by the Holy Spirit. He went and preached to the spirits who were in prison. Now that's describing the ancient world as a prison. The people in it were reserved to judgment, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited. Now, isn't that interesting? He doesn't say that God waited for 120 years. He says that the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved from the water. The divine long suffering waited for 120 years. And the divine long suffering didn't just wait, but the divine long suffering preached. Remember through Noah, the preacher of righteousness, until God said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. I'll give 120 years, and then the deluge will come. And at that point, um, the world is not being so much preserved as reserved. Or at least the moment that God closes the ark. People are still alive, but they are not preserved under grace. They are reserved for judgment. I mean, that judgment's coming now, and nothing can change that. Preservation has become reservation. S same was true with Sodom and Gomorrah. As long as Lot told them what was going to happen, there was preservation, there was grace. But the moment Lot left the city, it, that preservation became reservation. Reservation for destruction and the fire and the sulfur that came from heaven.
destroyed them all. So the old world became a prison, Sodom became a prison, and this world will become your prison too if you choose to make your home in it. If you choose its values, its ambitions, and its lifestyles, you will change from being preserved by God with a hope and an opportunity to being simply reserved under judgment. Right now you're preserved. Don't become reserved. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Believe that. So we believe it by faith. Well, with a view to the help and uh, blessing of God, let's turn again then to that chapter where we were in the morning. And that's in the second letter of Peter. And we were considering aspects of the last days. In verse 10, there's a focus on the very last day, which is the day of the Lord. And we read in verse 10 that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And just to set that a little uh, more firmly in its context, let's just read verses 10 to 13 again. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise or roaring, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And the second coming isn't to be viewed as a standalone event, as it were, but one of a series of events that occur on the last day, including the resurrection of the dead, the destruction of the entire cosmos, the renewal of the cosmos, and the final judgment of all the living and all the dead. So the personal second advent or second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ puts all these events into motion. And so when he is talking here and when God through the Holy Spirit is telling us here regarding the second coming of Christ, we're to view it in that context, in the context of judgment, destruction and renewal. And of course, as I highlighted in the morning, the apostle is urging us all to have the correct view of these things, the correct view of his coming, of the judgment and destruction and renewal of the cosmos. First, to make sure that we believe it by exercising faith in the word of God, which reveals it. So that's the first thing. And that's really what we were looking at this morning. And I have something more to say about that tonight. So we're called to believe it. The second thing is that we're called to look for it in the sense of hoping for it, expecting it. And then third, we're to live our lives in the light of it in a particular way. The thought of these events, chief of which is the return of the Lord, is something that should move us to live in a particular way. And to strive, he says, with the diligence to be found without spot and blameless. Living lives that are distinguished by holy conduct, as we'll see a bit later on. Now, as I said, we saw in the morning how uh, we need to believe these things. That Christ will indeed return and that that return will be followed by judgment. Now, Peter goes on uh, to describe in some detail uh, 
the events that follow. Now, not all of them by any means, but he does go into unusual detail in connection with the destruction of the cosmos. And he mentions in a little detail too the renewal of the cosmos which follows. Everything dissolved and then everything renewed. As we have in the book of the Revelation, behold, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I make all things new. So the Christ who by his word brought all things into being is the one who will dissolve all these things and once again bring them into being, reconstituting nothing less than an entire cosmos. And the one who was well able to do it first time around is the one who is well able to do it second time around. Now, as I say, he, he really focuses in on that, the destruction of the world and the construction of another one. He doesn't go into the other events that characterized the last day, but the rest of the scripture does. And without diverting too much from where we are, I think it may help us to focus in a little better if we try and take in an overview of what the rest of the Bible teaches in connection with the last day. The last days as such are a long period of time. In fact, you can say effectively that the last days stretch from the first coming of Christ to the second coming. And there are certain behavioral trends that manifest themselves as these last days progress. But these last days culminate in the last day. That's the one that ushers in the final state, culminating itself in heaven and hell. For one group, the everlasting Sabbath of God, everlasting rest. For the other group, a place that's characterized in Scripture as a place where there is no rest at all, either day or night. It is absolutely without Sabbath. Now, we saw in the morning, and it's emphasized here too, that this day of the Lord, when it comes, it comes suddenly and unexpectedly. We're told that it comes as a thief in the night. Doubtless, like the day on which Sodom was destroyed, and the day on which the flood began, when the fountains of the great deep were opened up, this day will begin like any other. Just as the sun rose over Sodom, so we're told in Genesis 19, so the sun will rise this day too. And again, as the Lord Jesus told, in connection with both the flood and Sodom, people were eating and drinking, buying and selling, and planting and building, and marrying and being given in marriage until the very day on which the judgment of the Lord actually fell. And sadly, of course, that judgment will find people unprepared. Uh, some unprepared anyway. Of course, there will be some people eating and drinking, buying and selling and planting and building, but they're watching and they're waiting for the return of the Lord. There are other people eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building and getting married and so on, but they're not watching, not waiting for the return of the Lord. These are the foolish virgins who have no oil in their lamp. The others are the wise ones and they have oil in their lamps. And even when they're asleep, they are still waiting for the return of the Lord. All our lives, um, in many respects, are ordinary. We all do the same things, by and large. Of course, those of you who are not Christians will have aspects of your behavior that are not true in the Christian's life. That's undoubtedly so, but we all do these things. We all get up in the morning, we wash, we get changed, we eat, we drink, we buy, we sell, and so on. But the fact of the matter is that some of you are doing all that while you are watching and waiting for the return of the Lord. Others are doing these things without any eye on the Lord whatsoever. So when these people are eating and drinking and buying and selling, that's the Lord Jesus' way of saying that that's all they're doing. That's their lives. 
And sometimes they wonder about their lives, maybe as you do. What is the point of getting up and going to bed and eating and drinking? What is the point? It is a good question, and without God, I can't answer that question for you. I mean, you answer it as best you can yourself. Many people conclude that there is no point, and to be honest, I well understand that. But of course, if the Lord has made you, that's very, very different. And if you understand that there is a point and a purpose to your life, you're eating and drinking and you're buying and selling and everything you do will be different. Even in your eating, you will give thanks to God and you will eat to the glory of God. Whatever you do, do, as Paul says, unto the glory of God. So sadly, when the judgment comes like a thief in the night, it will find many people unprepared. And in that connection... Just in the passing, I I want to remind you that although strictly speaking, historically, we are moving forward to the judgment, there is another sense in which the judgment uh, stretches out its own hand and comes into our own lifetime. And it does that, of course, by means of death. Death is the great event that links you at the point of that death to the judgment that may still be 2,000 years in the future, for all I know, or 5,000 years. I don't know. No one knows the day nor the hour of Christ's return. But the single great event that links you to it is death, simply because the event of death and how you are at death determines how you will be found at the judgment seat. Those who die righteous will be righteous forevermore. Those who die unrighteous will be unrighteous forevermore. Die clean, renewed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you stay clean and renewed forevermore. Die filthy in your own sin, unregenerate, not born again, and that is how you remain into the endless ages of eternity. So you can only prepare for the judgment seat while you live in this world. You haven't got however long it takes until the judgment seat. You've only got however long you live. Because the way you die is the way you will be. After all, when we all die individually, we go immediately to heaven or to hell. The fact that we are many years later brought out of there to stand formally before God and publicly receive our sentences neither here nor there. It's not as though on the great day of judgment anyone's going to be surprised in that respect. All those who have died are either reserved in chains until the formal judgment is pronounced or else are already experiencing the blessedness of God. I mean, if you consider the multitudes of the saved tonight in glory, if you consider the multitudes of the lost in hell, none of them are confused about their destiny when the day of judgment comes. They know. Of course they know. It's only us who live who may be in some kind of doubt about that. But at the point of death, those doubts are removed. So remember, yes, indeed, we are going forward to the judgment. But it comes towards us in the event of our death. And the only way, of course, in which you can prepare for that judgment is by preparing for death. And the way in which you prepare for death is by repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to prepare for that. You've got insurance policies for who knows what. And who knows what it may cost. It may cost a lot to insure your car or your house. But are you actually insured yourself? Is that not the most important thing to insure? And to have assurance that you have insurance To be absolutely certain that you have repentance and faith and that you are prepared to die. When Amos says in his prophecy in chapter 8, prepare to meet thy God, he is effectively saying prepare to die. And if you die prepared, you will meet God without shame on your face. And of course that reminds us too that just as the judgment day will come, on the world like a thief in the night so when it puts its tentacles into our own lives personally it also comes like a thief in the night judgment day is a thief in the night death is a thief in the night 
Not always. Sometimes he comes close and he leaves a calling card and he says that he will be visiting again within a week's time. Some people know it's time up. But very often, death comes like a thief in the night. All the more reason to make sure, my friend, that you are prepared for it. Prepare to meet thy God. So then, the last day will certainly come, and it begins with the return of Christ himself. As I mentioned in the morning, and as the Bible says, that return is similar in some respects to his departure. When he ascended into glory, there was a visible aspect to his ascent. The disciples saw him rise. Now, some people, mockers, like we read of here in chapter 3, scoffers, they've always been around. They scoff everything. They say, well, did, did he shoot through the cosmos? Did he go to the outer regions of outer space? The answer to that is no. The follow-up is don't be so ridiculous and don't be so absurd. He- heaven is not something you reach by traveling like a rocket forever. It's another dimension which is reached simply by passing through a portal, that's all. You, you pass from the one to the other. Einstein himself spoke about wormholes through which you could conceivably pass from one universe to another. And all these things, people are just groping after what God's got already. People think they're innovative, discovering new things. God's always been there first. You pass into heaven by passing through a portal from one dimension of existence into another. But nonetheless, the, the disciples were allowed to see the Lord rise visibly before he was taken out of their view, to convey to them the idea of ascension, to convey to them the idea that he's being raised up to a higher plane, to convey the idea that he's being brought home into the heaven of heavens, where God resides in the fellowship of his people. God doesn't need a residence. But where his people are going to be, he needs to reside. And that is the heaven of heavens, where he resides in the fellowship of his people. And the Bible tells us that in the same manner in which he left, so he will come. He will come visibly. Of course, his first coming was visible too, in the sense that he was born an infant, child. There's another sense in which that was incognito. Few people saw him. Fewer still recognized him. But Jesus himself tells us that in his second coming you don't need to speculate because he says as the lightning shoots from one end of heaven to the other and lightens up the whole heaven so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And as the scripture says every eye shall see him. The manifestation of his coming will be visible to everyone on the inhabited earth. As well as being visible, it is audible. Now I think the Lord Jesus Christ's ascension after his death was audible too. He was raised in heaven, uh, to heaven with both hands extended in the posture of a benediction. And I would personally find it easier to believe that he pronounced a benediction and blessed his people in the event of departing. Uh, in, in a way, it's effectively the Lord saying that I leave you with my blessing and my blessing will continue with you always, even to the end of the world. But when he returns, well, few heard that, but when he returns... We're told that he returns with the shout of an archangel and with the voice of a trumpet. So just as it's the case that every eye shall see him, so every ear shall hear him. And I suppose it will be fair to say that in most cases the world will hear the coming Christ before they see him. It is the noise that will come into their ears before the sight comes into their eyes. And of course, too, as well as being visible and audible, the scriptures emphasize that his return will be glorious. As Christ said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory 
with all the holy angels with him. Now, of course, that was very different from his first coming too. There is nothing more humbling, nothing more humiliating than to be born uh, where the animals are and to have a feeding trough as your crib. But into such destitution, the Lord was born. A picture from the very beginning of the fact that people have no room for the Lord. Not just in the inn, but in the world itself and in every human heart. But when he returns the second time, it is in his glory. And that glory will not just be seen, but recognised. There is a difference. We could all see a glory, but not recognise who possesses it. But the astonishing thing is that when the glory of the Lord is revealed in his second coming, everybody will know who he is. Now you say, well, how will they know who he is? Well, they just will. They just will know who he is. In Revelation 6, which we read earlier, we're told that the people who see the coming of the Lord will desire to be hidden uh, from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The Christ will be known. It will be a kind of spiritual intuition that will be bestowed on everybody when the Lord comes. It is most certainly him. And then this coming of the Lord will be followed by a resurrection. A resurrection that comes in two stages. Paul tells us that first of all, he says, the dead in Christ will rise. Now that's a wonderful thought. I mean, suppose he were to come tonight. Before we are raised up to glory, if we are Christians, those who are dead in Christ already shall rise first. I don't have to go time, I don't have time right now to go into how the Lord raises the body, how he reconstitutes the unique DNA of everybody and raises them as they are or were. Can't do that. But the fact is that the dead in Christ shall rise first and their renewed spirits will be reunited to their renewed bodies. Separated maybe for thousands of years, Abraham has not seen his body since it was buried in the cave of Machpelah. But when every body is reconstituted and renewed, it will meet the renewed soul. And at last, body and soul will be perfect, both conformed into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a wonderful thought, Christian. To you it's a wonderful thought. It must be to see him as he is, to be like him, to be like him in body as well as in spirit. After that resurrection of the Lord's people, those who are alive belonging to the Lord they shall be raised up, lifted up, we are told, as Christ was lifted up in his ascension. And Paul says that in the process of lifting, they are changed. Not going through the process of death, but Paul puts it this way. He says that our mortality is swallowed up by immortality. Our corruption is swallowed up of incorruption. We are changed, he says. We shall not all die. Those of us who live will be changed. He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, changed, just like Elijah was changed when he was raised up living into heaven. Just as Enoch was changed when he was raised up alive into heaven. So we shall be changed. You know, you can tell from the way that Paul speaks about these things that he almost wishes that he was going to go through that experience himself. Although um, he would gladly accept 
leaving right now and being with Christ, as he says, which is far better. Although, he says, I know that for me to live longer is better for you. And so be it. But there was something in him when he said, we who are alive will be caught up to meet with the Lord in the air. You feel he puts it that way. He doesn't say those who are alive, but we. I think he puts it that way because he identifies so much with every Christian. And he identifies so much with that experience himself. To be raised up, not to taste of death, but just to be transformed like that in the twinkling of an eye again into the likeness of the Lord Jesus. A wonderful thought. And so when the dead rise and the living are raised, the Christ who has come will take the whole of that church back into glory with him. But the unbelievers, they rise too. But they die first. The return of Christ means the death of all who do not believe. But that is almost instantaneously followed by the resurrection. And that's a different resurrection, friends. It's a different resurrection. They, they don't rise with incorruptible bodies, with, but with the same corruptible bodies with which they were laid in the grave. And they are led by the angels to the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, you will all understand that when the whole cosmos is brought before the judgment seat of Christ, there's no debate as to who is who. It's not as though everyone appears the same and there's a judgment and then everybody knows. No, the group are immediately split into those on the right hand and those on the left. You can tell by looking at them who they are. You can tell by looking at them who they are. It's written in their faces. It's in their clothing. It's, it's very evident who they are. They know who they are themselves. The judgment seat is only a confirmation of what they already know. And it's only then that the, the, the destruction of the cosmos is completed. Now I say completed because I think it already begins. Uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ is returning. Because, as far as I understand it, and some of these things uh, I will say so when I'm just not sure about things, and I'm not sure about this, but I think the Bible does indicate that the people who are living at the time will see signs of the decay of the cosmos when the Lord himself is returning. We're told that the stars fall towards the earth. Now, of course, uh, you've got to remember that um, this is imagery, uh, the, the Bible says things like the sun rises, the sun goes down. Um, that doesn't mean that it's geocentric in its view. I mean, do you, do you say that yourself? The sun rose today. What does that say about your belief? Nothing at all. It's just the way we speak from perspective. Now, the same is true in the Bible. When it says that the stars fall to earth, that's how it appears, that they are all descending. Uh, everything seems to be in meltdown. There is something visibly happening in the cosmos. And in fact, Peter tells us that it's not just visible. He says that there is a great roaring sound. It's the sound of a conflagration. It's the sound of a cosmic fire, as we'll see in a moment. But the point I'm just making is that this destruction of the cosmos appears to begin while the very events of the Lord's return and the rising of the people are actually ongoing. The people on the earth are aware that the earth is coming to its end. Now, the agent of this destruction is actually fire. The first time God destroyed the world, he used water. And he brought the water back, as I said in the morning, in its subterranean channels. I was mentioning in the morning, just for the benefit of those who aren't here, that God filled the world with water. At the point of creation, it was entirely covered with water. Um, he then brought it into its subterranean channels, and with the flood, it spurted up again, and it went down again. And as 71% of the world's surface is covered with water, there are three times as many uh, gallons of water under the crust 
as there are on top of it, three times as, as, as much. But that ignores the fire. Under that is a mantle that is molten, hot. Now and again, bits burst through that remind us that there's something, something seething under there that God has kept in control from the beginning. But like everything else that's kept under control, God will loosen it. And that's what's being taught here. First, in connection with the heavens, we're told in verse 12 that we are looking for, now I'll come to this in a minute, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. That's a strange expression, by the way, that we are hastening the coming of the day of God. How can that be? Well, we'll see. But anyway, we're looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements melt with fervent heat. So the heavens here dissolve. The Greek word is loosen. And the elements, were told, melt with the fervency of the heat. And the impression that it gives upon the earth is of the whole thing passing away. A dissolution of the cosmos itself. But the focus, he says, is on the earth. And he does focus on the earth. It's not just the heavens that are dissolved. He tells us too that the earth, this is halfway through verse 10, that the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Now for us it's the earth that matters, of course. People often say, well, you know, the earth is nothing. It's one little planet. It's, it's so minuscule as not really even worthy to be called a speck of dust. That's actually true. I mean, it's not, it is not a speck of dust in comparison with the size of the cosmos. And people say, well, are we really that important? Well, yes and no. There's a sense in which we definitely feel our smallness when we contemplate the universe. But is it the case that the earth is unique? Is it the case that the earth is, is actually something special in the universe? Yes is the answer to that question. It is absolutely the case that it is unique and that it is different. Cosmologists are now of the view that it may well be possible that the earth and our solar system is in the centre of an expanding universe. The Bible does say that God stretches out the heavens. It's interesting that they say that, because certainly spiritually and morally and in terms of God's creative design, the earth is very much at the centre. So why the rest then? Why these endless millions and billions of miles? Why these countless millions and billions and trillions of stars? Well, there's quite a simple reason for that in a way. I mean, if you were going to create a world and going to create people in your own image and likeness, and if you were going to stamp upon them from the moment of their beginning your own immensity, your own eternity, your own magnitude and your greatness and power, how else would you establish such a, such a thing but by creating a, an almost infinite stretch-out universe that was absolutely and utterly mind-boggling? And is that not how it works? It is how it works. When I look up into the heavens which thine own fingers framed, the, the sun and the moon and the stars which were by thee ordained, then say I, what is man that he remembered is by thee? Or what the son of man that thou so kind to him shouldst be? The whole universe reminds us of God's immensity and his eternity the sheer power of God, the sheer size of God, the absolute greatness and magnitude of God. And we boast in ourselves. We boast in ourselves. But the earth, we're told, shares the same destruction as the universe. We're told that its elements melt. It's dissolved first and its elements melt. Now, the elements 
are the basic building blocks of the universe. The, the Greek wor word means the basic building blocks of anything. So you could use this word element of the letters A, B, C, D, and so on, which constitute the basic building blocks of language, or one, two, three, which are the basis of numerology. But the elements here are the chemical elements that constitute the universe that God made. Now these elements combine, and God has ordered their combination. Some of you will probably remember from school your periodic table of the elements. These elements are the base elements. They, they're the elements you find that consist of only one kind of atom. Now God combines these. For example, you have the base elements of oxygen and hydrogen. But they are combined by God into water. He oversaw that combination. And it is for our good and for our welfare. But when this conflagration begins, all these bindings of these elements are torn apart. And everything is reduced to its original element. Not only that, but all these elements melt with the sheer fervency of the cosmic heat. Now, people are grasping after all these things. People are astonished at the heat that they find in the universe. And they're always speculating about where it came from and, and so on. I spoke in the morning about the pinhead exploding and contracting, exploding and contracting. But God is the source, like I said in the morning, of all this energy. And just as he used intense heat to make the universe, he uses intense heat to break the universe. Heat. Heat like we can't imagine. It's, it's, this, by the way, is what causes uh, cosmologists to err in things to do with the age of the universe and things like that. They, they think that the processes that work today are the processes that have always worked. Now and again, their paradigms fall apart. They're already thinking that perhaps, after all, the speed of light at the point of the Big Bang was infinitely greater than it is now. Well, a creationist would have said, yes, we would have told you so. Because you have to factor into the beginning of things the sheer miraculous power of God. Nobody denies the things that science has proved true. The rate at which lead decays into uranium or potassium into argon or carbon into carbon-14 and so on, nobody denies these things. But what we do assert is that the beginnings of things are different. The speed at which things happen, the heat, the intensity... Because God did it all. And God uses the heat he wants and works at the speed he wants. Do you think God is limited by the speed of light? Absolutely not. We, well, those who are engaged in the field know that at the center of the Earth's core, the temperature is about five and a half thousand Celsius, which is the same as the surface of the sun. A bolt of lightning is five times hotter than the surface of the sun. A bolt of lightning is about the same heat as the core of the earth. The core of the sun is 15 million degrees Celsius. These numbers are mind-boggling. That heat is mind-boggling. All that is held in check, not by laws, who made them, but by the God of these laws. God holds it all in check. God holds the molten mass of the earth in check. God holds the sun in check. Its growth or lack of growth in check. The sun and the moon and the stars which were by thee ordained in their place to function exactly in the way that God wants them to function. And when God gives the word, all that is unleashed. Every atom in the universe, every atom, think of the power in an atom. Think of the number, how can we? The number of atoms in the universe. Think of the unleashing of that power at his command and will. So that the God who brought all these things into existence now unleashes the power in them and says, burn! And they burn. The whole universe does. By the way, this fire of which the Bible speaks here is not a natural process. The end of the world is not going to come through climate change. It's not going to come through nuclear holocaust. It's going to come when it is triggered 
expressly by the word of God at the point at which the whole cosmos is destroyed. The earth goes with the cosmos, cosmos with the earth, and the whole thing is triggered by the word of God. In fact, nothing can make more plain the fact that this fire is different than that. I mean, how could an event, an ordinary natural event, that destroys the earth, how could it destroy the cosmos? No, it's set on fire by God. In fact, that's the original Greek expression in verse 12 here, where it says that we look forward and we hasten the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, literally in the Greek, being set on fire. Now, I wish that that literal element had actually been brought out in the translation. In other words, translation's not wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just that there's an aspect that you wish had, had been brought out. It's very explicit in the Greek. Being set on fire. So it's not just something that happens. It's, there's an agent. God says burn. And it burns. Not that long ago, a few decades ago, the general consensus was that the sun would eventually cool and the earth would freeze and that's the end. In recent years, because believe it or not, science is fashionable, like clothes and everything else, the recent theory is that the sun will grow and expand and instead of freezing, the earth will actually burn. Well, that's getting closer to the truth. But the earth doesn't burn because of the sun's expansion. It burns because God sets it on fire. And God sets it on fire because it's a judgment. Remember, as we saw in the morning, the earth is not just preserved in grace, it is reserved for judgment. Remember both these things. I explained them in the morning. Don't need to do so again tonight. Preserved in grace, simultaneously reserved in judgment. And it isn't just the earth that is destroyed. You'll notice in verse 10, at the end of verse 10, in the final clause, it says that both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Now, what are the works that are in it? I suppose in some ways you would ask a a more basic question first. If the earth is destroyed, why specify the works that are in it? I mean, if if the whole thing is going to become a molten mass again, then why specify that the works that are in it are going to be destroyed? Well, I think there is one reason for that, and one reason only. It's just to emphasise to us that everything that looks so grand and spectacular, uh, all man's and woman's achievements and attainments are all brought to nothing. To nothing. In art, architecture, culture, engineering, the building of massive dams, spaceships, the whole lot, it's incinerated and it's reduced to ashes. Just at God's command and will. We think these things are wonderful. And, in a sense, to the extent that they're done to the glory of God and shadow his creative power... Because God, after all, is the creator endowed us with creative power. Insofar as they shadow that, fair enough. But insofar as they speak of our attainments and our glory and our advance and our civilization, burn it, consume it. It's full of sin. It's full of unbelief. This world is cursed. It carries the curse. God will extricate from it what is good and he will burn up the rest. That's the world in which we live. And if if you are not a Christian, that's the world you're identifying with. And that is the world whose destiny you'll share if, if you are not in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, these things are vast. Pardon the pun, they're cosmic in their significance. Absolutely so for you and for me. Are we with God or with the world? Are we with the believers or the unbelievers? Are we Christians or not Christians? Are we living or dead? 
heaven bound or hell bound. So it's a reminder of how temporary our achievements are and how insignificant they are in the long term. You know, a day will come um, when everybody will look back on these achievements and say, well, what was that in the light of eternity? In the light, in the light of the ultimate realities, what were these things? Were they worth glorying? What is the effect of this last day on us? What's it supposed to make us feel or think? Well, the answer to that is, of course, again, something that needs to be done in context. This coming of Christ and this destruction of the cosmos is followed by two great events. The renewal of heaven and earth and the final judgment. Take first the renewal of heaven and earth. In verse 13, We're told that nevertheless, in spite of these burnings, we, and here he's speaking of the Lord's people, according to his promise. Now, he promised destruction. Here he's promising reconstruction. And one is as sure as the other. One is as sure as the other. According to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth in which Righteousness dwells. From the ashes of the cosmos, God remakes another one. Carrying no sin whatsoever, not even carrying the effects and the scars of sin. Now I'm conscious that some don't agree with that. Uh, theory that the that the cosmos is renewed, and I speak of I speak of them with respect. They they don't believe that that's how we should understand quite the new heavens and the new earth. But I think there are strong biblical arguments for saying that that's exactly what God means. The first reason why I'm saying that the new cosmos is a reconstruction of the old one is because, to put it in a contemporary way, God doesn't do annihilation. The concept of annihilation does not appear anywhere in the Bible. Oh, friends, there are some people who wish it did. You find them even in evangelical circles. They'll say to you, well, I believe that the souls of unbelievers will be annihilated. Won't find that in the Bible. Won't find that in the Bible. In fact, the whole concept of annihilation, as I said, just doesn't appear in the Bible. What God creates is here to stay. It may change. It may morph. It's here to stay. Matter is here to stay. Spirit is here to stay. Nothing gets annihilated. That's the first thing. The second thing is this, that the Greek word used for new here is a specific word. There are two words for new. One means what we would call brand new. For example, if you got rid of your car and got another car, that's a brand new car. The other word means renewed. So if your car was a mess and you got it made up, you got a new car. It's renewed. Now it's the word renewed that's used here for a new heaven and a new earth. And you know what struck me, actually, this is the way the Bible is. This never struck me before until I I gave out the psalm to be sung. The reason I gave out Psalm 102 was another reason. But this struck me when I was reading it, that as vestures thou shalt change them so, they shall all be changed, sure. Um, The the idea is is more of transformation. There is a change. Uh, Things alter. God certainly alters the universe. Not brand new, but something that was there already. Take also ourselves. When we are reborn, all of us, we're new creatures. But there's a continuity in that. You're still you. You've been born again, but you're still you. Um, it's the same soul that, that was dead in trespasses and sins that is now alive and living to God. 
He's just renovated it. He's regenerated that soul. He's cleansed that soul. He's purified it. He didn't take it out of you and put another one in. You wouldn't be you anymore. It's just a new you, but it's still you. That's what's happening here. Same universe, not the same universe. And is this not the Apostle Paul's teaching? There are these verses in Romans. Now, they're difficult verses, but isn't it interesting that Peter says in connection, he says that Paul wrote in these things some things that are hard to understand, he says. That's what Peter said. And he's referring to this. Peter, Paul, sorry, in Romans 8, speaks about the whole creation being subjected to vanity. Right? So the creation as we know it was made pure by God. Time's my enemy all the time. And I'm sorry if I'm speaking too fast, but I'm trying to cover the ground. The whole creation was subject to futility or to vanity because of sin. But Paul says that God subjected it like that in hope. Hope. What kind of hope? Well, he says, the creation itself will be delivered from corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Because we know, he says, that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs, a strange expression, until now. And we groan within ourselves, waiting for the redemption of our body. Notice the connection of the thought. As Christians, we're groaning groaning with ourselves, very often frustrated with ourselves, more frustrated actually with ourselves than we are with anyone or anything else. But you're waiting for this purification to be complete, your liberation, your redemption to be complete. Well, Paul says, so is the whole creation. Um, Earthquakes, volcanoes, deserts, vast swathes of deserts, that's an earth. That's not like it came forth from God's hand. There was no desert when God made it. No volcanoes. Nothing like that. But the whole earth, he says, is groaning, waiting for its own redemption. Now, what can that possibly mean? Except that it's part of the great renewal when God remakes heaven and earth. That's why the Psalms often end with pictures of the whole earth welcoming the Lord. The trees sing. The seas sing. Um, Poetry, yes, but poetry has meaning. And the meaning of the poetry is that the planet will be renewed by God when the meek shall at last inherit the earth. You wonder sometimes, when does that beatitude come through? That blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is when it comes through. When God makes a new world wherein righteousness dwells. Now you respond to that as an unbeliever. You respond to that by thinking of, well, am I going to be part of that or not? After all, there is a judgment to determine who dwells there and who doesn't in the new cosmos of God because Outside the new cosmos, there's a, there's a place that's it's always been there, and it always will be there. Even when God's renewed the cosmos, there is an outer darkness. That's how Christ describes it. People speak of multiverses. Well, here's your multiverse. There is another place, a dark place, a bleak, desolate, awful place. And if you're not in God's new cosmos... You are there. You are there. And the thought of the judgment putting you there should be something that strikes you, your heart with fear. Fear. These things are not stories or theories. This is not a philosophy. This is a divine revelation, friends. This is a divine revelation of truth. It's not a human speculation of origins and possible consequences. This It's a divine revelation of truth. And if God will judge you and me, 
And if that is our destiny, well, as Paul says, it is the terror of the Lord. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, before what he calls the terror of the Lord. And the call to you then is that call that we saw in the morning in verse 19 to recognize that God is still preserving you and preserving this world in his great grace and kindness so that you will not perish but that you will come to repentance. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, verse 9. He's not slow in bringing the world to its end, but he is simply long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you're a Christian, how do you view this day? Well, yes, you believe in it, but second, you expect it. You hope for it. You anticipate it. You're not afraid in a certain sense, of the judgment seat? No, not at all. Those who have gone to glory aren't afraid of the judgment seat. They are already arrayed in white. They know who they are and who they always will be. And if we are in Christ too, we know whom we have believed, and we are persuaded that he is able to keep that which we have committed to him against that day. We know that. By being justified by faith, we're not under condemnation and we look forward to seeing this new cosmos that will be full of God's glory the new Jerusalem that will be located there and the tabernacle of God and we hope for it four times Peter uses the expression looking for or looking forward to Um, we're about to pass into a new year and I'm sure we look forward to different to different things uh, as I'll, I'll say tomorrow, go to what shall we look forward, all right? Uh, what is it that we look forward to? Well, here's what the believer looks forward to. Four times, he says, we look forward to a new heaven and a new earth. Someone mentioned to me this morning after the service that these things are not maybe in the hearts of the Lord's people as they should be. I think that is true. I think judgment, the last things, a new heaven and a new earth are not enough. In the sight of the Lord's people. Myself included. We live too much in the world. Sometimes as though we were of it. But you look forward to it. Because your redemption draws nigh. And as well as that. You hasten this day in verse 12. You look for and you hasten. The coming of the day of the Lord. Now. You can't bring this day forward. So it seems strange to say that you can hasten it. In fact, some people think that the meaning is that you hasten towards it. Um, Not so uh, the King James is, and and the Gallic version too uh, puts it the same way, that you are hastening towards it. But the Greek expression is actually different from that, slightly different. What it says is that... um, you are hastening the day. Our catechism goes with that. Hastening the Lord's coming. The shorter catechism. When it says, what do you pray when you pray thy kingdom come? One of the things it says is that you are hastening the coming of the Lord's kingdom. So the catechism is, is more strict uh, to, to the Greek behind here. But it raises the question, how do you hasten it? Well, you hasten it in this sense. Um, because the Lord says that what happens when these events occur is that the, the people want it to happen and the people pray for it to happen and the people expect it to happen and they long for it to happen. And in that respect, by doing so, you are hastening the advent of that day. In effect, I suppose what it's doing is pulling us towards the day, but it's hastening the day for us. Even so, come Lord Jesus, the church prays. And when the church really prays that, the Lord Jesus will come. That's what it means by hastening it. Last of all, and extremely briefly, as long as, as well as hoping for it, we walk in the light of it. And really, um, it's not 
right almost to, to mention this without doing it justice, but that's all I've got to do. It, it does say in verse 11, since all these things will be dissolved, what kind of people you should be in holy conduct and in godliness. And again, verse 14, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless and consider that to you the Lord's long-suffering is salvation. It's time for you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's no wonder that he closes the letter in verse 18 by saying, Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. 2023, as far as we know, has not seen the advent of the Lord. But one day it will come. Are you ready? And am I?